I think you are the first performance analyst I'm talking to. And I am not able to actually figure out what, uh, what that means. So um, that's something special to me. What, what do you do? So the performance analyst uh, in an instructional systems design or nowadays the learning experience design context a performance analyst looks at the performance requirements of the learners who are really performers back on the job. So what is it they do performance-wise, um, which gets into, uh, and I have a specific orientation to this because uh, when I, I have a radio TV film degree, I joined a training organization in 1979 the people that were part of that organization all subscribed to a, a couple of people, a couple of gurus approaches to instruction. And the person that was, uh, and, I, and so I learned the methodologies of a guy named Gary Rumler, G-E-A-R-Y, A Rumler, PhD from the University of Michigan. Um, he's uh, deceased uh, back in the, 2008, but he was my mentor for a number of years, uh, beginning. So I learned his methodologies at my first job and my second job at Motorola, I worked with him. He was a consultant on many of my projects. And so I got a chance to work closely with him. But performance for him was people perform tasks, they employ behaviors to produce outputs. Mm -hmm. So you, you know, you produce a report or a document or something, or you give an answer, that's an output, which is an input downstream somewhere else. Could be an input that goes to many places downstream or just to one. It always depends. Um, and so you, when you're looking, when you're analyzing performance, you have to understand quite clearly what are the outputs people are on the payroll to produce. How do you measure them? How do you know a good one from a bad one? Who are the various stakeholders? You know, are there government regulators? Are there management? Are there downstream customers? Are there employees? So who are the stakeholders for the output? And who are the stakeholders for the process or the set of tasks, including behaviors? Uh, there's uh, behavioral tasks that we can see and we can count. There are cognitive tasks that we cannot see, we cannot count, we don't know what people are thinking while they're doing. And so, but we, that's part of what we instructional designers or analysts or developers need to understand in order to build instruction or learning or job aids, which are nowadays known as performance support. So how do we enable performance? What's it really take? And so a performance analyst also helps the client understand, you know, the client may be coming to you for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they have new hires that don't know the job and we need to train them. So we can figure that out. They may have performance problems in their workplace and they think that training is the answer. So those I've learned to be suspicious about because what the data shows from decades is that most performance most training requests or learning requests that are related to a performance problem are not due to individuals' knowledge and skill deficits. They're due to other environmental factors, usually. It's not about the people. Mm -hmm. Rumler was clear about this back in, back in the 70s, 60s and 70s and 80s and 90s, and et cetera. Uh, Walter or uh, W. Edwards Deming, the quality guru, the late quality guru, he said that you know 94% of all problems in the workplace are due to the system, not to individuals, not to individual performers. And management's in control of the system, so if there's anybody to blame, it's really management. They need to fix their system. And the system is all encompassing. So I learned, at, and I got exposed to the gurus in the quality world, Deming, Duran, and a few others, when I was back at Motorola. So I've kind of embraced all of their philosophies, their approaches, their tools. I adapted rather than adopted most of those. And so I come at developing learning content um, with a performance orientation. The goal is to get people to be able to perform back on the job. I don't care what they learn 
from the classroom or from e-learning or whatever, that's, mm -hmm. they're going to forget a lot of it. <clears throat> Have I prepared them to go back to the job and be successful performing tasks to produce outputs to the stakeholder requirements, which means I better know what those things are before I create, before I uh, design and develop content. And so that's really what, a, that's a long answer to what does a performance analyst do, but I think it's really critical. And I've been in the business since 1979, and I would say that 90% uh, or more of the people that do what I do don't look at performance. They don't do that. They create learning objectives out of thin air. Maybe they're sound reasonable. Um, maybe they're, some of them are right, but they're, but they're not reflecting necessarily the authentic performance that's required back on the job. So they might start with objectives, but many don't. They might do a design, a careful design to really build, you know, people's uh, memories and their skills, or, or they don't. And most of the time, and especially since the advent of e-learning back in the uh, 90s, um, which was computer-based training back in the 70s and 80s. Um, they don't, they jump in and they start creating content and it mm -hmm. and probably, you know, has space validity, sounds right, sounds, of course, they'll need that, of course. Um, and they focus on topics and they don't focus on tasks and outputs. And when you focus on topics, it's kind of arbitrary in terms of how do you measure whether learning occurred. You can do a quiz, you can do multiple choice questions, you can do fill in the blank questions, you can, but, but does that, is that really going to predict people's ability to perform back on the job? So I also come from the notion that when I analyze performance, what are the tasks, what are the outputs, that informs immediately my learning objectives, the terminal objectives of performance, the enabling objectives of knowledge and skills, it informs the final test, if you will, which is a performance test doing the work, real work, last week's real work that's already been done by somebody else, but you're going to do it now, or a simulation of that real work when things are too complicated and you can't take the time and effort to have them do the real work. So you have to take elements of the real work and see, can they practice, can they do it? And mm -hmm. That also informs just the, the test is really a practice with maybe feedback. And the final practice with feedback is the test, in my view, of how I approach things. So this performance analyst thing is core, it's central, it's critical to good instruction or learning or a learning experience because it's going to prepare people to go back and do their jobs. Um, so that's what I've been doing as a consultant since 1982. And that's what I did in the two jobs previous to that because I was lucky and learned these, this philosophy and these approaches for uncovering and discovering you know, what was really required. I love that approach actually. Um, in Germany, I see way too often that um, sometimes when it comes to learning events, um, then whoever manager uh, got in the topic, they didn't think about the outcomes. They thought, okay, they need time management. And afterwards, they're happy because the trainer can tell them, okay, um, everyone was happy. And then being happy is not the best measure actually for um, any successful no. thing. I mean, basically, then they can even spare the trainer, send them all to a nice barbecue, and then they're happy too. I don't know. Um, well, and so and so part of our, our issue in uh, because we don't understand performance by and large across the industry, across mm -hmm. the planet, we, few, there are people who do. So I'm overgeneralizing, but um, they, we measure and report out learning activities. We do not uh, uh, measure and report out business results. We do not say that guy can now do produce a widget better, faster, and cheaper. And here's what it was, the baseline before he was trained. And here's what it is now that he's been trained. And here's the department before they were trained. And here's the entire department now that mm -hmm. been trained. So we result to level one, you know, uh, smile sheets, happy, this indicators, reactions to the learning experience. Uh, we may measure at the level two using the Kirkpatrick model, which goes back till 
into the 50s. Um, the, the mastery of the learning objectives, but again, if your learning objectives weren't informed by authentic performance requirements, then they are arbitrary, they may be partial, they may be somewhat good, but not complete, they may be accurate, but incomplete. And, and so we, we are caught with, because we don't understand performance in the first place, we can't measure it and report back to our clients, here's how we improve your performance. We reduced your costs. We maybe didn't make things go faster, but we simply reduced your costs by producing a higher yield, more quality, less rejects or what, less rework, whatever those sub elements are for the uh, business metrics that clients care about. And I mean, um, how does it then work in the real world? For me, it sounds like, okay, I need kind of a highly tailored training. So I'm imagining, okay, you as a consultant go into a company after they tell you, okay, we need a good training. Then you have a lot of investigation to do or like uh, to learn what are the actually outcomes. Then you produce every or like create the learning experience. Then you measure everything. I mean, um, Is that how it then actually is and how, how big are the groups? Because um, I'm struggling as well in my head. I'm thinking, okay, um, the learning objectives can be a very individual thing. I mean, one person may be um, a little bit more uh, competent in the topic and the other one doesn't, even if I measure it at the end by behavior change or something. Right. So, um, so is it really such a big thing or? Well, it, it's, I mean, so you don't, you shouldn't be investing shareholder equity mm -hmm. in low stakes performance, medium stakes, maybe high stakes, sure. High stakes where there's high risk, high reward or mm -hmm. both, you know, then you, then you need to have, uh, you know, you, I mean, uh, the people who develop brake systems for jet aircraft that carry hundreds of people, those brake systems, they are, mm -hmm. you know, they're done at, they're done at, at, I think 11 Sigma, you know, not six Sigma, but 11. Mm -hmm. Sigma. So they're, they, they fail, you know, whatever is 11 Sigma is, I can't remember, nine million times or something. Um, one time out of nine million. Um, and so we do preventive maintenance to make sure that they won't even fail once. Um, but so, yeah, so you have to understand. So when I do analysis for instruction, I do four types. I do a target audience analysis. Mm -hmm. I need to know who is in the target audience, what are their job titles, because there may be more than one. Um, What, what are their backgrounds in terms of what, you know, what are their prior knowledge from education and or experience? Because I might learn that my target audience includes degreed electrical engineers and other people. And degreed electrical engineers already understand AC, DC electrical theory. Mm. The other people will not. So when I learn those kinds of things, because I because you got to make assumptions as to what do they already know? What don't they know? And is that a mix? And if it's a mix, then what that will mean for me when I get into design after analysis is that I will have to create a more modular front end so that people can either test out or just skip what they already know. Mm -hmm. And they can get exactly what they need. But if you need to know AC, DC electrical theory for the performance, And some of you are degree engin electrical engineers, and we know from you didn't get a degree without knowing that. So you can skip that module or that chunk or what it should be called, because it's called many different things nowadays. Um, and others should get it because they're going to need to know it to do the job. So, so that creates a, a varied and a differentiated front end to most learning, whether that's a learning journey or a path. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is something that I've been doing since uh, 1981, cr creating training and development paths. I do what's called curriculum architecture. That's been my big thing through the uh, through the years. And I do development of actual the courses within a curriculum, or I develop job aids within the curriculum. Um, but so, so, yeah, you have to understand your target audience, and there's different ways to do that. You need to know, are they all in one building? Are they across the country? Are they across the planet? Are they have different languages? Uh, some are going to be learning in a classroom. Some are going to be learning out on a job site mm. in, under that sun or the rain. You know, where is this happening? So you have to understand, just like any marketing person would understand, where are they going to be using my product? You know, and so you have to, you know, borrow things from the marketing world, which is not a, a, 
new kind of thinking. That's very old. I was taught that back in 79. Um, but so you understand the target audience. The second thing is understand what are the performance requirements of them on the job within the scope of whatever the client wants us to look at, because they may not want us to look at the entire job. They only may want us to look at one part of the job. So what are the outputs, measures, tasks, what are the various roles and responsibility? Are people doing this all by themselves? Or are they working with finance and engineering and, and HR? And there's a whole bunch of people doing this collaboratively, or are they doing this all by themselves? So who's in the sandbox of performance? You know, who's who are the players? And so then you, that you can so you can identify what does ideal performance look like, and then you can ask against that ideal, what are the gaps? What's the current Eight gaps. Maybe not everybody is is performing at an ideal level. Maybe some people are, but maybe many aren't. What what's what is not ideal about most people's performance? And um, then once you understand ideal performance and the gap performance, then you can systematically derive the enabling knowledge and skills, and then you can uh, uh, look at all the clients existing content to see if you can reuse it as is or after modification or not at all because it sounds right, but it's not, it's no good. Mm -hmm. it's so, um, and then you take all that analysis data, that four types, the target audience data, the performance data, the enabling knowledge and skills data and the existing content, and you can go into a design effort. Now, that sounds like that's a lot to do, but when I work with clients, I've done the analysis, all four of those types, in a five day period. And mm -hmm. I, my approach to doing this work to make it go faster to be accelerated is to work with teams of hand-picked master performers, mm -hmm. uh, other subject matter experts, because maybe I need somebody from regulatory affairs and maybe somebody from the law department because of the stakes. And maybe the performers aren't, you know, they have to comply with laws and regulations and codes. And so they, so there's, so I may need some other experts in the room to make sure that our content, because it's high stakes, because we can inadvertently, you know, break the law, violate a regulation, get fined millions of dollars or marks, you know, so how, you know, so I, I need to have a group work with me with that analysis data to inform that analysis data and then create a design. So I do a facilitated group process for analysis, one for design, and I also do that when I do development. And I take mm -hmm. designs, which are, which are somewhat complex, mm -hmm. and I divide them into separate work streams so that I can work in parallel on a bunch of different content all at once and don't have to work in series. One, do A and then do B and then do mm -hmm. C. I start A, B, and C all together at once. We get done, hopefully at the same time, we integrate it, we pilot test it to make sure it's uh, accurate, complete, and appropriate. And then we release it into the client's systems for deployment or access. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, you know, you got to find ways to shorten the cycle times without hurting the quality of what you're producing. And mm -hmm. so uh, I, I was a co author uh, in a training magazine article in 1984 mm -hmm. about this. So I've been doing this a long time. I, I was also a co-author of an article and that related, the training magazine article related to curriculum architecture design using a group process. A couple of months later in 1984, we, I was co-author of an article with my business partners, both of these, mm -hmm. uh, in the NSPI journal. NSPI is now ISPI, the International Society for Performance. <laughs> improvement um and there is a german you're german correct yes indeed yes. all right so there's a german named klaus wittkum w-i-t-t-k-u-h-n mm -hmm. who's in germany he's a he's a past president of ispi he is uh he he worked with gary rummler in the 90s and uh, early 2000s just like I had worked with Gary Rummer back in the in the late seventies and eighties, um, and he he's got a I've got a video of him talking about 
him applying this performance orientation to training because he's got a training company in Germany. Um, I think the website is train.de, you know, because he was an early, early into the internet, I guess. Um, I believe that's correct. But anyway, I can, I can send you information about him and help you make a connection with him. Um, He's got two different companies Mm -hmm. and one focuses on training for his clients and another one focuses on um, doing more performance improvement projects. Those of us who do this performance analysis often help clients understand that training is not going to fix their issue. Mm -hmm. And we can help point them to maybe your process is broken. Maybe the consequence system Mm -hmm. to the employees is broken and out of alignment. Maybe the data and information that people have isn't sufficient. Maybe it's Maybe it's good data, but it's not timely. It comes too late and they have to pr- go do work without it. And when they discover the data that they need, then they have to do rework because they <laughs> take guesses and now they know what the right data is. Now they got to do rework and it, and it increases costs and cycle times and all those kinds of things. So um, that and that kind of the people that do the performance analysis, as I was describing, they usually sometimes become known as performance improvement consultants, um, which is well beyond performance-based training or instruction or learning, but it's really looking at all the other variables to performance besides knowledge and skills. Hmm. Um, have you seen one of the, or have you created your own uh, just-in-time session for the LD conference? Yeah, I had two of them this year. One, I had one from last year that we uh, we reused for this year, and I created one for this year. Yeah, because then, I mean, uh, you already used our platform, I guess, with the um, several tiles. And basically, um, my problem in Germany at the moment is that um, we have a very heterogeneous group of customers. Some use it uh, to create their own onboarding trainings. For instance, they let even employees um, create their own courses for other employees with kind of basic knowledge that they need for the job, which I think is useful, but that is kind of one group of the um, people that we have. Then we have small like freelance trainers um, that are using our tool, bringing it to their uh, blended learning experience. Um, But what I'm struggling with in Germany at the moment is we're still growing, but uh, I don't see um, kind of a, a common pain point. So I, I don't know how you differentiate yourself. Now, there is, a, there is a tool, a methodology called quality function deployment. It comes mm-hmm. out of Japan, which was basically instigated by people like Deming and Duran, quality experts from America who went to Japan post-World War II to help them improve their mm-hmm. degrees. Um, and so this quality function deployment is used by the auto company. So Daimler mm-hmm. probably uses this thing. So it's sometimes called the house of quality, but it basically takes your product and your features, which have benefits, mm-hmm. which be advantageous to some of your customers. Not all features have benefits to all mm-hmm. customers. Not all benefits have advantages for certain customers. So you take your your product and that information about your product, and you compare it to other products. Mm-hmm. So I would suggest that you look at who are some of the bigger players who offer platforms similar to you so you can compare and contrast your product to theirs. Mm-hmm. And that will help you understand where are you at parity? You have it, they have it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, you don't have it you're at a disadvantage and they have it. Mm. That that doesn't mean you fix it because you don't know how important that thing where you're at a disadvantage. And you Mm. look, where do you have advantages? So where do you have advantages? Where are you at parity? It's equal. Where are you at a disadvantage? And therefore, what do you promote as Mm. you market your products? Because customers, prospects have options. And Mm. you to help them see what's what advantages you might bring to the market. Maybe your pricing is lower. Maybe you mm-hmm. have features that they can use. Maybe you know you help them store more content uh, for the and, and you have it uh, replicated in different things. Mm-hmm. 
lightning strikes your building, you don't, you know, go completely out of business. So, so there's different things. So that's just a tool and a methodology to compare and contrast products, uh, somebody's product against many of their competitors so they can make intelligent decisions. Mm -hmm. Do I need to make improvements to my product or how do I market and sell my product? Um, and so again, I mostly do this upfront analysis, the design of the configuration content um, to modularize it because of who the target audience is. And, what, you know, and there are people with the same job title that do actually different things. So they don't all mm -hmm. need the same thing on that end. So they, they come in with varied incoming knowledge and skills and their jobs are varied. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the things an analyst has to figure out. And my methodology is to work with a team of those people so they can tell me how to mm -hmm. configure it because they know I'm never going to know the nuances of who knows what and what the very job variants are. That's going to take forever. And that's too long. And that costs a lot of money. So mm -hmm. I leverage my clients, master performers and other subject matter experts to, to inform the analysis efforts, to inform the design efforts. Um, and then again, like I said, I don't, I've done, I've done development where I bring in pe other people to do the development on, uh, especially digital content. Um, I don't do that myself, but I'll assemble a team, do that for my clients if they don't have that capability, but all of my clients usually do. So you brought up this, you know, uh, where anybody can create content. Mm -hmm. The, uh, there's major issues with that. Um, what the research shows is that you, me, anybody only can recall 30% of what you would give to somebody to instruct them to tell them how to do something. Most of our knowledge is non-conscious. It's not conscious. So when subject matter experts are interviewed by developers, the subject matter expert can only give them 30% of what a novice would need in order mm -hmm. to perform. This is just the nature of human memory. Mm -hmm. So most of our knowledge is non-conscious. It's not easily recalled. And so when, and, and the warnings have been out in the marketplace uh, since the early 2000s about this fact that most trainers, stand-up trainers mm -hmm. are subject matter experts or experts, performing performance experts, and they teach others. And, and so what the research would say is that when you have an expert teach others, they're only giving them 30% of what they need. Mm -hmm. And so it qu takes quite a deliberate effort to go beyond 30%. You can interview uh, subject matter expert after subject matter expert after subject matter experts and take mm -hmm. the differences because they all know a different 30%. Mm -hmm. Know the very same thirty percent, and so if you if you interview a succession of them, you're going to get a fuller. And what the research suggests is that you can get up to eighty five percent of what mm -hmm. not needs. You can't give them everything because the costs. You'd have to interview mm -hmm. hundred people, and and you got language differences, semantics, and such. But um, so what my approach is, I work with a team of eight to twelve people. Mm -hmm. And I'll get closer to that 85% in one meeting rather than having to interview, 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 and then reconcile the differences. You know, person A said this, B said something different, C said something different. I got to take the person A, B, C, and D, and E said these things. Do you agree? Well, they may or may not. And so I may get some things reconciled and other things not. Mm -hmm. get disagreements. And then I, what do I do? So the notion of letting anybody create content is problematic. And so in the U S in, in Germany, that may not be as well known yeah. uh, in the U S I don't think it's also well known, but it is known by others. Mm -hmm. So if we were to do a marketing campaign to say, you know, anybody can create content with our system, then you're going to get attacked because that's a faulty premise that anybody can and should create content. They will create partial content. Mm -hmm. and, and so if your tool, I don't, now I didn't see this with your tool, your system, 
that it was an authoring tool. I mean, it let me author things in there. But if you were to sell your tool as an authoring system and you give people a methodology on how to, to deal with this non-conscious knowledge issue, how do you assemble groups of people to work together in a collaborative way to get closer to 100%, knowing that mm-hmm. you can't get 100 percent you maybe have to get 85% or so. But how do you do that? Because so it's so if you're just te- giving me a tool like a car, what you need to do, I think, is teach people how to drive better, how mm-hmm. to create content better. It's not just the tool. The tool is the means to facilitate that, but there's other methods, other concepts that need to be embraced in order to produce good instruction, because otherwise mm-hmm. you're Quite frankly, a lot of garbage, you know, and it may and people may like it. And they may have you know good reaction smiles, sheets, tests on those things, but it may not transfer to the job and have a positive impact. And that's what you want. Mm. So, so I don't I don't know what else, what kind of guidance to give you, but I just had to react to that because it, it's a huge issue, and it's one of the things that I've used to differentiate my practice is that I help my clients produce instructional content that's performance oriented, that will more easily transfer and will have a positive impact because I'm focused on the outputs and the tasks and the cognitive tasks and the behavioral tasks. And I'm not missing a whole lot of content because I'm dealing with just one person, one author, one subject Mm -hmm. expert. My methodology is to work with teams of people who will add to what each other says, correct each other, uh, come to a consensus on, you know, what is it that that we need to teach these, the audience in order for them to be able to perform. If we're dealing with a topic, you know, the, the, the history of Western Europe, you know, and we're creating tests, all of that is arbitrary. So what's really critical for the target audience to know about Western history, Western mm-hmm. European history? I mean, that's, you know, do they need to know this or that or that? You know, it's all kind of arbitrary. It's whatever mm-hmm. the instructor wants. In, in the enterprise learning, there are tests to be performed to produce outputs, no kidding. And so that you can anchor to that for sure. Mm-hmm. And either guy at the end of the training can do that job or he can't, or he can do it kind of well, but he's really slow and he, and he has, he creates, you know, rejects with some of his work. So you can measure that. That's more, um, that gives you more of an anchor. So if I was you trying to, I would, I say I, what I offer my clients is a tool to facilitate instructional analysis, design and development and maintenance of the content. Mm -hmm. And I also would give my clients methods so they can do this better. Because everybody, if everybody's got a tool, then you're competing with everybody's got a car. Well, you know, there's nicer cars and cheaper cars and faster cars and cars that hold more people. So what is the key differentiator for your tool that you, you would, you know, that would be important? So I don't know when I built my content in your tool, because I did a video outside of it mm. and then imported it. And I created, wrote some content, but I also imported some PDFs mm. and some Word documents and a PowerPoint, I think. And, and so um, that was a, an authoring system as much as it was a system to um, organize content created elsewhere mm. um, you you'd be competing with companies that have authoring systems that would create the equivalent of a powerpoint slide deck uh, mm. that would create videos um, they've got that all kind of built in so but but again i'm i'm kind of guessing on that because i i don't have a lot of experience in that i only know what i read and hear offhand and it's it's personally not that critical to me because that's not my worry my mm. clients you know would figure that out. And if I, if I needed to worry about that, then I would assemble a team of people that I know that, you know, know how to do those kinds of things. 
I love the point that you're making. Um, first of all, I, I, I highly appreciate uh, what you're telling me because uh, one of my biggest issues actually with the whole learning and development sector in Germany is that um, most of the things are so tough to measure. And um, my background is actually mathematics and physics. So um, I love hard science. Now, um, I'm very intrigued, first of all, um, with your point that uh, just giving them a tool without a methodology won't work. Um, I think I can agree. Basically, we started um, in Germany giving as well workshops so uh, for our new customers so that they um, kind of get an idea um, how to do with it. But now listening to you, first of all, I'm not as much an expert um, as you are anyway. Um, I'm really intrigued by the methodology you're talking about to actually figuring out um, what are the things that should be changed and kind of giving my customers a methodology to do it. Can you suggest any kind of literature to me that I could go into? Well, topic I, I've deeper? written a bunch of books. I am, uh, so these are my last three books. Mm -hmm. You're going to have them on my desk because I'm working on one. This is the one that's in review right now mm -hmm. uh, with uh, about 11 people and I'm going to update it and I'll probably publish it in September. September. So this is an Amazon book. This is a, says not for resale across the little band here because it's a proof. Yeah. The book before that was this, the three D's of thought flow analysis. So this mm -hmm. is my approach to figuring out what are the cognitive tasks mm -hmm. that go before, during, and after behavioral tasks. Mm -hmm. Behavioral tasks we can see, we can see guy, he, he you tighten the bolt, the bolt down on the mm. on the on the the, hit, the nut on the bolt. Um, how did he know how much to tighten it? You know that kind of thing. Um, so, so this is this is a book about creating instructional content, um, doing the analysis. This is the book before that, which was conducting performance based mm -hmm. instructional analysis throughout the addy like effort. So I do project planning, I do analysis, I do design, I do development, I do pilot test, I do revision and release. Mm -hmm. This book talks about my entire process and the fact that when I do analysis in all of the phases, I don't get into analysis paralysis because I'm not trying to boil, boil the ocean for a cup of tea. Mm -hmm. I'm doing analysis just in time, just when I need it. I don't need it all mm -hmm. in you know, one period of time way before we do design and way before we do development because that slows projects down and clients are usually in a hurry. So my goal is to get to developing content and mm -hmm. testing it as soon as possible and doing analysis at the appropriate time. So these two books are about analysis. This book is about my design, how I design instruction then mm -hmm. based on this analysis data. And now, but you... Yeah, thank you. I highly appreciate it. I learned a lot and um, it was amazing. That's all I can say. Thank you.